Let's give the Lord a praise today. Come on. I can't sing that with the, uh, without wanting to shout. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise. Would you do that? Lord, we give you praise for all that you've done for us. Amen.
sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Sound of a symphony in my ears. Holy water washing me. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful symphony in my 
God, today as we prepare um, our hearts and our minds to hear your word, Lord, I pray that you would give us clarity of mind, Lord, clarity of heart, Lord. Let us receive what you want to speak to us this morning. Lord, we love you, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Uh, my name is Nicole Shaffey, if I haven't got to meet you yet, and I have the privilege of doing a ministry called Chi Alpha, which stands for Christ the Ambassadors, at the University of Akron and at Kent State. And so before I got to do this great ministry, I was a college student that had the real joy and honor of getting to be a member here at The Light. And so I say this every time I come and speak, but it is still just as true that I owe um, so much of my confidence and ability in ministry to Mary and Larry because um, they believed in me as a um, really wild uh, college student. They somehow gave me a microphone. I don't know why, but they did. And <laughs> I got to do the three things you need to know. And um, what an honor that was to really feel affirmed and um, really championed in my call uh, by Pastor Larry and Mary. And so it is always such an honor to get to be back here. It feels like home. And so I'm so thankful for each of you to welcome me back uh, to the light uh, every time we get a chance to be here. And so um, with that, I am so excited to be able to share with you a message about Palm Sunday. I have never shared a message about Palm Sunday, but I have loved celebrating Palm Sunday as a child. And so I grew up um, not uh, too far from here. I grew up in Akron, and I grew up in a, a large Methodist church, and large not necessarily in number of people, but large in building space. And it was one of those churches um, that had the beautiful stained glass windows, right, that are just gorgeous when the sunlight peeked through, and it had a beautiful center aisle. And I remember... Um, during Palm Sunday as a child, we would each get palms, just like what you see here, these palm leaves, and uh, people would bring their old coats, and they would throw the coats down the center aisle, and um, I don't know whose idea it was to give small children palm leaves, but they did, um, and so I remember uh, being so excited because what would happen is the choir would come down uh, the center aisle, and they would be singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, and we got to echo that back, but the problem was my mom was in the choir, and some part of me thought it was so great to get to smack her with a palm branch, and so every year I looked forward to just like getting to, you know, give her a little a little whack with the palm branch. That was not a really great thing to do, uh, but I did it, and so I always <laughs> really looked forward to that on Palm Sunday, but uh, beyond that, as we read this morning in Scripture, right, Palm Palm Sunday is such an incredible time that we get to read about in Scripture and get to experience even today. And so I am excited to do that with you. And so the message I prepared for this morning is called Preparing with Perspective. And I don't know about you, but uh, just like me as a child, my perspective changes over the years, right? Things happen, we learn, um, God reveals more of himself to us, right? And our perspective can change. And so um, I'm excited to read the text of Jesus's entry into Jerusalem, see his perspective, look at the people around him's perspective, and then glean some perspective for us today. And so I know I already prayed, but if you're willing, would you pray with me one more time as we get ready this morning? So Jesus, I thank you that we have the access, um, Lord, to the word of God. And Lord, I thank you that, God, we are able to gather here together and, and get to experience community and get to experience um, you, Lord God. I pray that as I speak, Jesus, that you would um, protect my mouth, Lord. Would I not say anything that you don't want me to say? And Lord, would I say everything that you do want me to say? And Lord, I pray that today our hearts would be open to hearing from you. God, I pray that you would speak something fresh into each of us. Lord, even if this is like our 80th Palm Sunday, God, I pray that you would speak something fresh to our hearts and to our minds, Lord, that we would leave here with a renewed sense of understanding of how good you you are. Lord, how worthy you are of all of our praise, God, and we would be encouraged um, with the truth of who you are. And so, Lord, we love you, and we pray this in your name. Amen. 
Awesome. So we are going to read today, but it's really funny. I forgot my Bible and my phone. So could you grab my phone? I'm, I can't really read from memory, but um, it's, yeah, thanks, honey. Thank you so much. Okay, so we are going to read in the book of Luke today together. And um, kind of up until this point, right, we see Jesus' life unfold in the book of Luke. And so I love um, starting with, right, the angel's visit to Mary and how wonderful that is. And we see that. And we see um, Jesus' birth, right? And we see his time as a small infant at the temple. We see him as a child at the temple. Um, We see see his baptism, right, in the book of Luke. We see his temptation, his earthly ministry, his calling of the disciples, his teaching, his commissioning of the disciples, the transfiguration, healings, teachings. Then we see his prediction of his death, right? And then Right up into this point, we see his entry into Jerusalem. So that's where we're at. So as we get kind of the whole context of where we're going to be reading today, we will pick up reading in Luke 19, 28 through 44. And so I am going to pull that up on my phone. Or actually, no, I'm not. I'm just going to read. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's read together. So it says, after Jesus has said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage in Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those of you, oh, sorry, those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As he, oh, sorry, as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They were good listeners, right? They said exactly what the Lord told them to. That's very good. All right. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. We said that this morning, right? Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city. He wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day, what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when the enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Whoa. There's a lot there, right? Right. So... For me, my perspective has changed, right? As I see Palm Sunday as a child getting to, you know, wave the branches to now as an adult saying, God, what do you mean by this? What, what did they miss, right? What, what, what's going on here? And so I am excited for us to get to walk through this text today. And so just to kind of recap, right, what we saw We saw that the people were excited, right? Can you imagine the excitement of Jesus coming through your town, right? Running to the edge of the road to see him riding in on a donkey. And they were praising him, right? We read that this morning, right? They were saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, right? They were excited, right? Their long-awaited Messiah had finally come, and they looked expectantly to do for them what they wanted him to do, right? And so they knew he was a king, and they were ready for him to be their earthly ruler and political leader, right? At this time, they were waiting for someone to come change the world that they lived in, right? That's kind of the context of what we understand of that time. They knew he was a conqueror, and they wanted him to come and take his rightful domain, right? 
they were filled with incredible hope, and they were looking to Jesus to fulfill all of their earthly desires, right? Do you blame them? Aren't we kind of like that sometimes too? <laughs> like, I'll be the first to admit I am, right? Jesus, you will get me out of this mess that I see, right? And unfortunately, sometimes the seen dominates what is unseen, right? And so, um, but here's what's really interesting, right? So we see, um, if we put ourselves in that situation, right, we see the people probably seeing shoulder to shoulder, praising Jesus as he rides in on the colt. But what is Jesus' response? right? It was weeping. So interesting, right? And so he isn't weeping out of sorrow for himself at this point, right? This is, we, we know the account in the garden, right, as Jesus is praying before the crucifixion, but this isn't that, right? He explains to us why he's weeping, right? And so he says it um, in, in verses 42 through 44. So if we can put those back up. He says this, right? If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes, right? The days will come upon you and your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. Here was like the crazy part, right? They will not leave one stone on another. Why? Right? Because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Whoa. How sobering. Right? How sobering. I promise this message is not um, so dreary. Okay? If you're like, what? It's rainy outside. Why are you saying this? Right? This is not time for a depressing message. It's not. There is hope. Right? I promise. But I think it's important that we look and we see what's really going on here. Right? And so Jesus wasn't weeping for himself. He was weeping uh, for the lostness of the people he came to save, right? So the people, although they were ambitious with their praises, celebrated what they believed to be the fulfillment of their desires, right? Having no idea um, what Jesus had shared with them about multiple times was that he was coming to die, right? And so um, quick pause. I am one of those people that, judge people in the Bible pretty often. And I don't know if anybody else is like that, right? I remember um, reading, you know, the Old Testament for the first time and, you know, telling somebody, I don't like the Pharisees. Like, they annoy me so bad. Or, I'm not the Pharisees, sorry. I don't like the Israelites. Like, they annoy me so bad. I was like, how do they not believe that God will provide for them? Because they've seen God do so many things, and I was like, you know, here is God splitting the sea for them. Here is God providing manna for them. Why do they still doubt him? And I thought to myself, man, Nicole, why don't you look in the mirror a little bit, right? Like, how many times has God provided for me, right? How many times have I seen God provide in incredible ways? And yet I am still so prone to doing what the Israelites did and doubting, right? And I've seen God do incredible things, not only in my life, but in the lives of many, many other people. And so, so interesting, right? It's easy to judge, and it's easy to judge in this situation, right? For the people cheering for Jesus on the side of the road, like, don't you know what he's coming to do? How can you miss it, right? How can you be so blind? How can you not perceive the times? Because here's the thing, Jesus literally says this. I'm going to uh, quote scripture. This is Matthew 20. Just really quickly, it says, G here's Jesus, right? The son of man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. Okay, I get maybe if you're like, okay, what do you mean betrayed? But he continues, right? He says, they will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And then on the third day, he will be raised to life. Like, it doesn't kind of get more blunt than that, right? Like, Jesus said this before it happened, right? Jesus is like, this is what's happening, right? And the disciples still don't understand, right? And I'm going to be honest, like, if I, if I uh, were there um, with palm branches in my hand, right, and putting my cloak on the ground for Jesus to walk past and being so excited, about this glimmer of hope, right? This long-awaited Messiah, I am tempted to ask myself, and I want to encourage you, you don't have to say it out loud, right? But ask yourself too, like, would I have missed it too, right? Would I have been so preoccupied with what I thought was going to happen, what I wanted to happen, that I would have missed 
what's really happening, right? Would I be one of those people sitting shoulder to shoulder, right, saying, Hosanna, and then just days later yelling, crucify him, right? Man, I, I don't like thinking about those questions because I, I don't like what I think I would do. Knowing myself, right, knowing how much I can miss things, would, would, would I be there too? And so today, right, as we kind of ponder this passage, right, as we spend some time and we really think about all the implications of this passage, I want us to draw some encouragement and kind of challenging ourselves and each other. Um, how are we going to take this text and, and not just celebrate the exciting parts, right, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, but look and really meditate on the hard parts, right, the parts that are um, in this text that are, are hard to hear, right? And so um, I want to say, though, I am not uh, sharing this from a perspective of, like, I've already figured this out, right? I'm not sharing this, like, here's what it, three steps that I did that made it all right, right? Like, that's not where I'm at, right? I am a journeyer uh, that I am on the journey of, of letting the Holy Spirit transform my heart into stepping out into obedience in these ways. And so I just want you to know, um, if you feel like, I'm not there yet, I'm not either, right? And so I just want to share that, right? I'm still like the palm branch smacker in my heart, okay? And so like, I'm sharing this from a place of encouragement that I feel like the Lord is directing all of us, not a place that I've already been and accomplished, okay? So just so that you know, okay. So the first point um, that I see in this text that I think we can glean from as an encouragement is this. Let's not miss what God is doing because we're preoccupied by what we want him to do, right? Let's not miss what God is doing because we're preoccupied by what we want him to to do, right? It's incredible. Uh, Tim this morning shared an awesome word for the Lord that was like, smack me right in the face, like in the good way, right? Like that was so about this, right? Like God is doing something, right? We don't know what maybe, but he is doing something. Even if we can't see it, even if we can't understand it, even if we're frustrated by what we see, it does not negate that he's doing something, right? And Tim, you know, really nailed home, like, he is working all things together for his good and our, our good and his glory, right? We even sang that today, right? And so it's so easy to do, though, right? Being distracted by what's seen is so easy to do. And so here's the thing. The palm branch holders, right, the people shouting Hosanna as Jesus enters Jerusalem, missed God's plan unfolding before them because they already had their mind made up about what Jesus should be doing, right? They wanted him to be politically led, a leader. They wanted him to overthrow earthly government, right? They, they wanted him to do all of these things that would be seen and it would be immediate, Right? He came to establish a kingdom that has no end, right? But they wanted his ki the kingdom that they see established immediately, right? We can be like that too. I'm a microwave, not a crock pot, right? Like I'm like, I want to see it done now. <laughs> and so Lord, like great that you're working things out for my good in the future, but like what about next hour, like <laughs> in, in 20 minutes, right? <laughs> like, right, I'm the McDonald's drive through not the sit-down restaurant. Like that's my personality, right? And so I see that in, in these people too, right? That they wanted to see things done now and didn't understand the eternal perspective of what was happening in their midst, right? And so I, I've done that, right? I think about too, um, like John the Baptist, right? I just got to share a message about this, I think like a week or two ago, where we see John the Baptist sincerely asking Jesus as he sits in prison, right? Like, are you the one? And he, like, here's the thing. I've always read sarcasm into that, but he wasn't being sarcastic. He was being sincere. Are you the one that we've been waiting for, or should we wait for someone else? Because why? Jesus wasn't doing what John had expected him to do. John is sitting in prison because of his obedience, right? He, he, he spoke the truth, right? And he's in prison because of it right? And so here's John sitting there, and he's saying, I know that Jesus is out healing, setting people free, raising the dead. Why am I sitting in prison? And if you've read the Bible through, you know, right, that people break out of prison because of God all the time, right? Like, it's like the angel's like, here, come on out, you know? And so we see it's not like God can't do that, right? But that didn't happen for John, right? 
John said, I prepared the way for you, and now I'm in prison. Right? Man. So here's John, right, sincerely asking Jesus, are, are you who you said you are, or should I wait for someone else? So we can be prone to do that. And so kind of my last encouragement about this point, or kind of this last question to kind of leave us thinking is this, like, will we turn from Jesus when he doesn't do what we think he should, right? Or when he does the unexpected, right? Will we, like the people shouting Hosanna and then saying crucify him, right? Or the people like John, right? Who we, we obviously see that he didn't turn from Jesus, but there was sincere questioning in his heart. Are you who you said you are? Because he wasn't doing what he thought he should be doing, right? And so for us, like, what will it take for us to be able to say, God, I trust you, <laughs> even when you're doing something that I can't perceive, and, or I can perceive it, and I don't think it's right, right? Like, let's be honest, some of us are there too, right? Like, I see what's happening here, and I don't like it, right? Like, and how is this working for my good? I don't, I, this doesn't feel good, right? It doesn't look good, right? So hard. Okay, let's continue on. Uh, number two, kind of point number two I see in this text, is let's listen to, not just hear the Lord, right? Let's listen to, not just hear the the Lord. And so throughout this passage and even um, in the Gospels, right, we see Jesus explicitly talking about his death multiple times, right? And he wasn't just talking uh, to thin air, right? He, he was around the disciples, right? Obviously, it's recorded in Scripture, so somebody had to hear it, right? So Jesus told them what was going to happen, right? Jesus told them, right, like we even read about um, in Matthew 20, right? He says, like, I, uh, the Son of Man will be betrayed. We saw that happen, right? Uh, that uh, he by, betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death. We see that happen, right? Turn him over uh, to the Gentiles, be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. He said, like, he told us, right? Like, he told them, right? And so, it's crazy because they heard, but they didn't listen, right? Man, so hard. So um, I've learned recently about this kind of phenomenon, but it's like true. It's not like a, you know, conspiracy thing. It's like it, it really is true, called confirmation bias. Maybe you've heard of it too, where you receive all the information you receive through the lens that you want to receive it, right? And so I realize I do that a lot in my life, right? We look for things to confirm uh, the things that we want to be true, <laughs> and then we look for things to refute the things that we want to be false, right? And so um, I think sometimes, unfortunately, and I can do this, right, where I read the Word of God through confirmation bias, right? Well, oh, you said this, so it must mean this for me, even if the Lord didn't say that. And so, um, you know, I look and I think uh, about a time recently, right, that um, I was really wounded, like this past year, not physically, very emotionally, right? I was very wounded, and I was very caught by surprise, right? I was very like, how in the world could this happen? I thought I understood what was going on. And in God's kindness and his gentleness, he showed me where the misstep was, right? He showed me that it was my desperation that impeded my discernment because I wasn't willing to listen. I thought I knew what God would want me to do, and anything that anyone said was received through confirmation bias. <laughs> it's just going to affirm what I already want, I'm going to do, right? Like, how many of you, you ask for wisdom, but you already have your mind made up? Like, I can be like, that's right. You're like, what do you think about this? And you're like, I already signed the paperwork. Like, you know, like, it's, it's so difficult, right? We do that. We do that. I do that. Maybe you don't, but I do, right? And so I look and I think, what could have been saved if I would have listened, right? If I would have not been desperate and I would have just listened to what the Lord was saying, not just heard him, but listened, right? And so for each of us, right, what would it look like for us to say, God, we want to not just hear you, but we want to listen to you too. And Lord, would you show us when we're, you know, listening to what you're saying only to apply it in the way we want to, right? All right. Let's move on to our last point that I see in this text that I want to encourage us with 
today, and it's this. It kind of builds off of our other points. But um, after we've listened to God, right, we trust and obey him regardless if it's logical to us. And I would kind of put like a little side note in there, or anybody else, right? Because um, maybe like, would you raise your hand if you're in here today that God has asked you to do something that didn't seem logical, Okay, right? Some hands, right? Where you know that the Lord is asking you to take a step out into obedience, right? Maybe it's changing a job. Maybe it's um, giving something away, right? Maybe it's uh, moving. Maybe it's, you know, whatever, right? And it didn't seem to make sense when you did the numbers, right? Whether that's figuratively or literally, right? Where you're like, this doesn't add up. Right? And I would venture to say, like, tithing's even like that, right? Where we obey God even when it doesn't make sense. Where we're like, God, I have nothing to give. And then we give, and then we're like, wow, God, I have more, right? Like, crazy, right? So sometimes, too, right, God will share us, uh, tell us things, right? We obey, but then people around us don't understand, right? Good, well meaning people, right? And so will we commit, right, to listening and trusting and obeying? regardless if it makes earthly sense, right? And so we see this um, happen in the Bible, right, where we see it kind of gone wrong, right? So here's Jesus telling, you know, the disciples, this is what's going to happen to me, right? One of these death predictions, and what do we see Peter do? We, ha- we see Peter challenge Jesus and say, no, 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 Lord, like, that's not going to happen. And then these are kind of strong words, right? But how, we see Jesus rebuke Peter, right? He says, get behind me, Satan. Like, you do not have in mind the things of God, right? Crazy, crazy, right? Because it didn't make sense to Peter. And if I were Peter, it wouldn't make sense to me. What do you mean? What do you mean that's going to happen? You are who you are. What do you mean, right? Um, So we see that, right? And so even at the beginning of the story, this is really interesting to me, right? I love this part. I love the parts in the Bible that, um, like, I think there are many things in the Bible that make me laugh, right, that are just very interesting. Like when um, the the teacher said, you know, how can I be born again? I can't go back in my mother's womb, right? Like I laugh about that because I'm like, I, I would think that way too, right? And so we see kind of one of those funny but interesting and prophetic things happening at the beginning of the text we read today. And so back in verse 28, right, right where we started, it says this, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up from Jerusalem, verse 29. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Okay, (laughs) yes. But why? Right? Like we get, and obviously it's fulfilling scripture. That's why. But the disciples, they were just obedient. Did that make sense to them at the time? Probably not. Right? They are the thick in the middle of history, and they're just obedient even if it doesn't make sense. Right? And we don't see them even arguing with Jesus. They could have said, Jesus, there's a cult right here. Because there probably was. Right? Like, Jesus, why do I have to go to a stranger? Right? Jesus, what if they don't, like, what, what if they don't give it to us? Right? Like, all of these things, all of these logical thoughts, but yet we see, right, that Jesus just says, if anybody asks you, right, and they did exactly what Jesus said. So kind of my, my last question as we look at kind of this part of the text is, like, are we willing to look a little foolish for God? Right? Are we willing to do what he's asked us to do, even if it doesn't make sense to ourselves or anybody else, right? Like, are we willing to put ourselves out there in faith and say, the Lord told me to do it, and I'm going to do it, right? And, and I don't know, right? Maybe the text says, but I'm not sure. But, like, did those disciples know that they were fulfilling Scripture, Did those disciples know that they were fulfilling prophecy about Jesus entering in on the cult? Did they know? I don't know, right? But how amazing is it that, like, they got to play a part in that, in that journey, right? Something so simple, and we get to do that too, right? I think often about how many times, right, our lives, um, if we kind of made a tree, right, we have incredible spiritual lineage, 
leading up to us and departing from us, right? Think about who told you about Jesus, right? And then who told them about Jesus and backing that all up. And all of that is rooted in obedience, right? Think about all the people that you have told about Jesus and who will, they will go on to continue telling the good news to, right? And how that is all just steps of obedience, even when it doesn't seem logical, right? So cool. So as we kind of end tonight, I would like to just take an extended time to pray, uh, just pray through what we've read in the text, and really allow the Lord to examine our hearts, right? Would we be vulnerable before him? He's trustworthy, right? Would we be vulnerable to allow the Lord um, to speak something to us, right? Invite us into a deeper level of trust with his perspective in mind this morning. And so if you are willing, would you um, pray with me this morning? God, I thank you that you um, are alive. Jesus, I thank you for um, what we know, Lord, that we have the privilege of living um, 2,000 years after this happened, God, where we get to see the whole thing unfold. And Lord, I thank you that, that we have this perspective. But God, more importantly, we want your perspective. God, I thank you that, Lord, nothing catches you by surprise. And so God, as we um, really enter in this time of reflection, Lord, I pray that you would give us your wisdom. God, that you would give us um, the ability to see things as you see them. Lord, would we listen? God, would we, would we obey? And so, God, I pray this morning um, that, Lord, you would do a great work in our hearts. God, I pray that, um, Lord, that you would allow us to see what you're doing. And, Lord, that you would melt away the distractions, God, that keep us from seeing what you want to do, what you are doing. Lord, and so I, I pray, and, and you can join me um, here today or online, that um, if there is anything that we need to repent of, right, where we look and we say, God, I was not willing, I was not willing to see what you were doing because I was so forceful about wanting what I wanted. Where we repent of that. And God, we ask that you would give us fresh vis vision, Lord, fresh wisdom. God, would you, through your word and through your Holy Spirit, Lord, speak to us what you want to do, Lord, what you are doing. And Lord, give us the grace to partner with that. Lord, I pray that you would, um, Lord, clean out our spiritual ears, Lord, that we would not just be people who would listen, but God, that we would be people that would hear. Lord, hear and listen. God, I pray that by your spirit, you would show us those moments where we are hearing, but we're not listening. Lord, I pray that you would um, give us the boldness, give us the strength to be willing to lay down our wants. God, to be willing to lay down our biases and be able to clearly hear what you're speaking. And Lord, last, I pray that you would give us the strength to obey. Lord, that you would give us the ability to obey. Lord, we want to honor you. God, we want to obey you. And Lord, sometimes it is difficult, especially when it doesn't make sense to us on earth. And so God, I pray that you would grow in us a greater trust of you. God, that as we say that you are God, Lord, that every fiber of our being would believe it. God, that we would not be ridden with doubt, that we would not, like John, have those moments of sincere questioning of, are you who you said you are? But rather, God, that we would have an increase in our faith that, Lord, you are who you say you are. And, Lord, that you are Lord and King over all. God, and forgive us when we're impatient, when we don't like what is visible, when we don't like what is seen and circumstantial and temporal, God, and we want to forcefully have our way. Lord, I pray that you would give us the grace of heavenly perspective. God, that you would quiet our hearts, you would slow us down, Lord, and you would show us the long play. God, that you would show us what you're doing in light of eternity. God, would we not miss it? 
Lord, like the people that we read about today, Lord, with our palm branches, God, this Palm Sunday, Lord, would we not miss it? Would we not be so preoccupied by what we want that we're missing out on what you're doing? God, would we lay down, Lord, our, our, our desires, Lord, even if they seem noble? Lord, I pray that we would lay them down because we desire to have what you want, Lord, more than anything we want. And so, God, we, we pray that today, God, that we want what you want, Lord. We want um, our hearts to reflect your heart, Lord. And, and, God, we desire to put you in your rightful place as Lord over our lives. And so, Lord, we love you, and we pray this in your mighty name. Amen.